we live in coyote country and they're not going away. Coyote sightings in Seattle remind us we coexist with wildlife. Hear from the experts on how to make that relationship work. Make yourself look novel and big and yell, go away coyote. A new program works to turn down the volume, helping our endangered orcas. For them, noise is a full body experience. Noise is a vibration of the whole medium that they exist in. At one time, it was a cornerstone species. Then it went absent for decades. Are we now seeing a resurgence? We saw our second largest spawning event uh, since the 1980s. These stories and more next on City Stream. I'm Enrique Cerna in beautiful Lincoln Park, and welcome to a special wildlife edition of City Stream. Located just north of the Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal, this 135-acre park has a lot to offer, including miles of walking paths and bike trails, plus athletic fields and play areas. And each summer, Coleman Pool is filled with heated salt water. It's the perfect spot to enjoy stunning views of Puget Sound and the Olympics. Much of Lincoln Park is heavily forested and is home to an abundance of wildlife. One species spotted here and elsewhere around the city is the coyote. These urban carnivores often go unnoticed, but they have been living in Seattle for decades. Producer Ian DeVere spoke to biologists and experts on what residents can do to stay safe and coexist with our wild neighbors. I have a high respect for coyotes. Yeah, they are so adaptive. I just think coyotes are fascinating in general. I just find them to be amazing animals. They're super intelligent, able to live in different places. This is an animal that has had to outsmart larger predators as their population expanded. And then they've slowly started to go from this more wild rural animal um, to do exactly what they do in all other metropolitan areas. In the early 1900s, coyotes essentially lived between the Rockies and the Mississippi. Now they're found, you know, from northern British Columbia and into Alaska all the way down to Mexico, coast to coast. Coyotes have probably been here for half a century or, or quite a bit more. First coyote was documented in King County in 1937 in Edom Claw. We hear a lot of, uh, you know, it's urban sprawl. And I think that's true for many, many wildlife species. Uh, but not for coyotes, because they're coming to us. They're, they're coming to where the food is. They're prey generalists, so they can eat lots of different things. There's some research going on right now looking at that actual question. The Seattle Coyote Study is looking at the diet and genetics of urban coyotes throughout the greater Seattle area. So we use all non-invasive uh, methods, so mainly just looking for scat out on trails and whatnot. Um, and then we use a process called dietary metabarcoding, which basically looks at the genetics of prey items within each of these scats and IDs it to species. That allows us to kind of understand what vertebrates and what plants that these coyotes are generally eating across a long period of time. Having the scientific evidence, uh, this is how many hundreds or thousands of coyote samples we've taken. And from these areas of the county or Western Washington, I mean, that tells us a lot. Mainly they're eating rabbits. Uh, they've got some chicken in their diet. They've got, they do have a little bit of cat. Um, everyone always thinks they're only eating cats. Not true. It's more likely that cats are hit by cars the, as far as the statistics out there. But if someone calls us and says, you know, uh, I've let my cat outside, is it possible that coyotes could take it? I can't say no. I can tell you from looking at scats, there's a lot of blackberry in there, but I've also seen them eating thimbleberries and blueberries. They'll eat a lot of cherries as well. Small mammals like uh, voles and rats that cause you know, infrastructure destruction or spread diseases and things like that. To the extent that um, coyotes are focusing on those types of prey items, um, it can be really beneficial to human communities. Uh, coyotes have a very intricate communication system. Those yips and barks are not, I'm coming for you. 
They vocalize just to keep social contact within the family group. Oftentimes that's just them saying, hey, who's out there? You know, I'm over here. So it's a non-confrontational call, depending on the time of the year. We get those calls all the time, right? There's 30 coyotes here. It's called the bow jest effect. Something to do with harmonics in their vocalizations, and it makes it sound like there are more animals than there actually are. So there have been studies that have shown that humans overestimate the number of animals by about a third. Sometimes when they see dogs or people kind of near something they care about, like their dens, they'll emit like a warning bark. And there's nothing to be scared of there. They're just communicating that you're kind of in their space and they, they might not want, not want you there. It's not uncommon for coyotes to follow people along green spaces or down trails. In Seattle, the, the peak kind of denning time is between May and June. And so that's often when we see that escorting behavior. And all they're doing is pretty much making sure that you're away from their babies because that's what they care about. That's what they're protecting. There is a tremendous amount of fear that doesn't necessarily need to be there. I've been doing this for 23 years and out of thousands of calls that we take, I'm guessing less than 10 times has a con uh, there been actual contact between a coyote and a human. Um, so it's very rare. We don't even have a coyote bite a year. It's more likely the animal's gonna follow you, it's gonna be inquisitive. Um, and that's when we need to have both adults and children educated to have a reaction that's appropriate. We call it humane hazing. It's really trying to just encourage coyotes to not become too used to being really close to people. I'm gonna throw this stick, you know, or if I've got a coat on, cause there's rain, we're raining right now, and make yourself look novel and big and yell, go away coyote. Any activity at all, any behavior you can do that makes them feel unwelcome, the more you can exclude, the better. If the whole community is doing that, that animal never has the opportunity to think, I've got it made in your backyard. The encounters we don't want to see is when the coyote doesn't budge, doesn't seem like it's scared at all. It may not seem like that big of a deal then, right then and there, but that's not natural for a wild raccoon, coyote, whatever, to be walking around amongst students on a college campus. People sometimes think that like feeding coyote is helping that coyote, but there's kind of a saying in wildlife biology that a fed coyote is a dead coyote, and that's because it will habituate coyotes to think that people equal food. That's just only going to lead one way, loss of fear, and then the ultimate removal of the animal. Lethal removals, you just change that territory dynamic. So that's an open house. We know that another coyote's gonna fill that void. The goal now is to educate the community to keep that new coyote wild. It is virtually impossible to reinstill fear into adult coyotes. Now with young coyotes, you can really ingrain fear into those coyotes. And, and that's really what we should be doing. In most cases, it's a peaceful coexistence. Coyotes live um, quite well without having any interactions with people. Mostly what it comes down to is making sure our food is secured, any outdoor food, not leaving pet food on the porch. Clean up your garbage, your compost, your garden. Uh, again, exclude as well, hot wire, fencing. You also have a pear tree and a plum tree. I know it's daunting, but you might want to try to keep that stuff picked up because that's why they're coming there. And there's nothing that Coyote will or can do to avoid that. It's on us to make them avoid it by making those spaces unfavorable to them. We live in Coyote country and they're not going away. So the, the thing of it is, is uh, learning how to live with them. If you come across an animal that may be a potential problem, call the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Enforcement. Call their office at 360-902-2936. And if you spot a coyote that poses an immediate danger, call 911. Just ahead, a new program aims to help endangered orcas by making their world a bit less chaotic. That story as City Stream continues.
City Stream returns from West Seattle's Lincoln Park. Now, just offshore, it's not unusual to spot a truly Northwest spectacle. Southern resident killer whales in search of salmon. Now a new program is testing how to help the endangered orcas. It's called Quiet Sound, and it looks to do just that. Reduce noise in waters these animals call home. Michael Crow reports. Beneath the waves of Puget Sound, the noise of the world above fades. Here, the endangered southern resident orcas rely on that quiet, speaking to each other in a complex language and using echolocation to hunt for salmon. But the human cacophony follows them even here. This is the sound of a passing ship recorded on an underwater microphone called a hydrophone. Sound actually travels four times faster and further in water than it does above water. And we know that vessels emit sound in the frequencies that killer whales need in order to communicate and hunt. Rachel Aronson is the program director for Quiet Sound of Washington Maritime Blue, which hopes to give these struggling whales back their peace. They ran a trial shipping slowdown last year from October to January, measuring sound reduction for the good of the whales. Between Port Townsend and Edmonds, they asked passing large vessels to voluntarily reduce their speed to 14 and a half knots or 11 knots, depending on the type. Hydrophones were used to measure sound levels. That's about a reduction of 30 to 50 percent from usual cruising speeds for these types of vessels. It was voluntary, so of 623 transits, 70 percent participated in some way and 53 percent fully met the speed targets. Whales were present in that zone 43 percent of slowdown days. According to their report, that led to a soundscape that was 45 percent less noisy, which they consider a fantastic result. But importantly, they found there wasn't a huge burden on the shipping system, which bodes well for future work, though it did add about an hour per trip. So far, we're hearing that it had a pretty minimal impact on commercial shipping. We didn't hear of any impacts happening at the port. We didn't hear of any impacts happening in the systems that receive the ship. From our conversation so far, it seems like it worked okay. It was a great opportunity to just, you know, add value uh, environmentally to Puget Sound. Matt Hanuxla is a Puget Sound pilot, the group that boards ships to help them navigate the inland waters. The pilots were the face of this effort, pitching the vessel captains on participating, and Hanuxla said as a trusted messenger, it was generally well received. I think it's fantastic. Uh, it's really rewarding in that you're moving a big piece of steel around to help out, you know, commerce and the citizens of Washington State, but at the same time, you're able to really do something that has some environmental impact for a positive. He felt like a voice for the whales and hopes it will make a difference. To make a successful impact, all parties have to maybe compromise a little bit because nobody is gonna ultimately win. So I think everybody came to the table willing to, to give up what they could to have a successful result. Noise is not the only threat that the Southern residents face, as state reports have identified it as one of three primary issues with pollution and prey availability. But it is one that might be simpler to address. The thing I love about noise pollution is that when you stop the noise, the noise pollution is gone instantly. It's not like toxics pollution where toxics can stay in the water on and on. And worth the effort when you consider the human-caused conditions these incredible animals face, the acoustic blinders of these busy waters. For them, noise is a full-body experience. Noise is a vibration of the whole medium that they exist in. It really limits their world, their scope of vision, as it were. For us, it'd be like being surrounded by a thick fog all the time. And with just 73 left, every little bit helps. They're a really small population. That means they get more vulnerable. We need to do everything we can to keep this unique group of whales alive and around. This program is based on an existing and successful one already running near Vancouver, BC. Quiet Sound hopes this data will help them improve the program and potentially make the slowdown an annual event. Next on CityStream, long ago it signaled spring was on the way. 
Then this run nearly vanished. But are we now seeing a resurgence? Just north of here, near Alki Point and elsewhere in Puget Sound, a natural phenomenon once played out during springtime. It was a seasonal occurrence as common as budding blooms and added hours of sunlight. For Native Americans and early Northwest settlers, this event provided both a rich food source and a piece of the local culture in this region. And it appears to be coming back. Producer David Albright explains. On a crisp spring day in Suquamish, across the water from Seattle on the Kitsap Peninsula, an unusual amount of marine predator activity gives hints of something happening under the water's surface. The scene is immediately recognizable to those with ancestral knowledge of the region. It's herring spawning season in Puget Sound. Yeah, herring is, is, is as important to salmon in a lot of ways. It's, um, it's always been a, one of the cornerstone species. Herring are a key piece of the ecological puzzle in Puget Sound and were an important food source for indigenous tribes. But as the human population grew around them, their numbers plummeted. We had been on a pretty long downward trend. Um, we had some pretty large fisheries that have since been closed. Um, partially in response to overfishing at the time. Some of our more iconic stocks have uh, declined by over 99%. Some stocks have disappeared entirely. Um, but uh, just recently in 2020, we saw our second largest spawning event uh, since the 1980s. It's a two-sided vegetation grapnel that we just drag to pick up samples of vegetation to check for eggs. There we go. So we've got a bunch of uh, sargassum as the algae, and a very heavy spawning event came through here. It's a good sign. With commercial herring fishing mostly halted in Puget Sound, numbers seem to be rebounding. In fact, Phil and his team are tracking a new stock or a group of fish that spawns together in a specific area that are spawning on beaches right near downtown Seattle. Scuba diver and filmmaker Laura James was one of the first to notice a spawning event off Alki Point in 2017. So we were out here diving one day and we were coming back up uh, from, from a dive and I noticed there were herring eggs. My dive buddy and I went on a little adventure around the point and we just started walking and documenting where we saw herring eggs and it turned out there were literally herring eggs from basically down by Cove 2, maybe a couple miles away from here, all the way down to Lincoln Park. Scientists have taken to calling this new stock the Elliott Bay stock. It's sort of a, one of the more interesting stocks because it's uh, both our newest stock, um, which is exciting, uh, but also it hasn't really settled on a, a preferred spawning area. So we've seen it at the Sculpture Park, we've seen it at Alki Beach. So far in 2023, the Elliott Bay stock hasn't turned up in its usual spawning grounds. Or if it did, it went undetected. This points to the need for more citizen observers to keep an eye out for herring spawning events. Laura uses the West Seattle blog community to help notify her of activity off Alki. I'll literally say, hey everybody, uh, could you watch the shoreline and, 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 and email me? Like literally email me personally if you see crazy activity along the shoreline. Another visible sign of herring which Laura was able to capture in these aerial shots, is white water. And it's uh, you know, essentially so much eggs and milk in the water that it'll actually turn the, the water milky. And so that combination of white water and a lot of predator activity is what you can expect to see. So indications are that things are looking up for our Puget Sound herring. Back here in Suquamish, the tribe is celebrating the return of spawning events like this one that haven't been seen in a generation. I mean, our fishermen today haven't, the, especially the younger ones, have never been in a herring fishery because there hasn't been a harvest full of numbers. It's, it's been, a, been a while since we've seen a large returns that you can actually notice. We're cautiously optimistic that uh, we're sort of turning the corner and 
conditions have allowed us to have a couple of good year classes and hopefully to start to see an increasing trend in our herring biomass. Cautious optimism sums it up well. A growing population of herring and other forage fish would be a welcome sign for some of the better known species in the region, since they are a key piece of the ecosystem that supports larger animals like salmon and orcas. The herring, herring in particular uh, are critical to as food for salmon, but uh, they also act as a uh, prey buffer for salmon. So we've learned that forage fish uh, actually will help reduce the predation on juvenile salmon from things like harbor seals and sea lions. The Elliott Bay stock, in particular, can be seen as a sign that efforts to improve our natural habitat in the city are having their intended effect. Where we first found it uh, near the sculpture park, there was an effort there to ensure that there was some, uh, some structure for habitat. So I think it is a sign that if we're thoughtful about how we're doing our development and try to maintain some of those key habitat features in the water, uh, these fish will take advantage of it. This is, a, this is a brilliant natural event occurring so close to a major metropolis. I mean, how many places can you have forage fish eggs being laid literally with a city skyline in the background? It's, it's amazing. Amazing indeed. Another small reminder that Seattle is at the doorstep of the Salish Sea's diverse marine ecosystem. Phil and his team did their final survey of the season in mid-June, but did not find evidence of herring spawning in Elliott Bay. Still, the numbers continue to trend upward, and they say if you spot signs of herring spawning along Puget Sound shores next spring, you could be witnessing the resurgence of a piece of the sound and its natural history. We end with another example of humans learning to coexist with wildlife. Beavers call many Seattle wetlands home, including an area about a mile northeast of here. As Michael Crow reports, these industrious little critters bring with them a long list of environmental benefits. Hidden deep in the green of Magnuson Park, the work of engineers, tiny furry ones. So this is the main beaver pond. Um, this is where the beavers live. Nature's construction crew, hard at work in Seattle City Parks, and tonight... Well, we'll see. We might be able to see a little better. Elisa Kerr of the nonprofit Beavers Northwest is on the lookout for them. Their lodge is kind of just around the corner and across the pond. Through all of these sticks, if we had x-ray vision right across that way. Magnuson Park has long been home to urban beavers, landscape architects shaping this pond to their liking. The signs are everywhere. So this is the perfect example of a beaver chewed tree. They've chewed all the bark off of the base of this tree and have started to chew into it. You can really tell it's beavers because of these awesome teeth marks that are in here. They do that for a number of reasons, to eat the sugary cambium layer under the bark and to gather building material for dams and lodges. But it's not just their construction that shapes the landscape. Their destruction encourages more growth too, like on the stump of these willows. And if I feel it, I can feel all those beaver teeth marks. It's kind of got this sharp, pointy feel that beaver chewed sticks have. And after it was chewed, it sent up new sprouts. And you'll see that happening over and over and over again. Um, beavers can continue to harvest and eat from them and build from them, and yet we still have this amazing um, growth. There are other benefits as well. Beavers slow the flow of water to form wetlands, creating habitat for animals ranging from deer to weasels to insects and birds. Those wetlands can also improve water quality by slowing it down on the landscape. In 2020 and 2021, Beavers Northwest conducted a survey with a King County Water Works grant in partnership with Seattle Parks and Recreation and found 13 active beaver colonies on Seattle Parks land. But like any roommate, coexisting takes uh, work. They also start to flood our trails. Beavers' industrious efforts can lead to expanding ponds and trails that don't drain properly if left alone, which is what brings Beavers Northwest here. They maintain a complicated relationship with their namesake animal, partially foiling their efforts with limiting devices to let water through dams. They've been managing them here since 2013. Everything I do is trying to help people and beavers compromise. 
We want to uh, keep beavers where they're at and let them keep doing what they're doing, uh, but also make sure that, you know, people infrastructure is still accessible and usable. But those installations are tough to see here through the summer vegetation, just like the beavers themselves. Yeah, so that could be one full side. So a few miles away in Kirkland. So we're just cutting apart the fence panels right now. We can get a better look at work underway on one of those limiting devices. Forbes Lake is surrounded by homes close to the water, and beavers living here have been a bit too successful in their dam building, raising the water level. This is a notch exclusion fence, which is a method of keeping beavers away from a notch in the dam, so allowing water to flow through the dam at a level that we determine and prevent flooding. For years, the homeowner has been doing battle, tearing down what the beavers build up. The goal here is to reduce that maintenance so that the beavers can be good neighbors too. The alternative to this type of device is that beavers would be completely removed from this system, so they would you know, not be able to be here, do their work, have babies, continue to spread out on the landscape. Um, so by installing a device like this, we're helping these landowners live with these beavers and kind of compromise with them. So we want these benefits that beavers provide by building dams, creating wetlands, but we don't want, um, you know, the flooding of infrastructure and particularly in this case, you know, septic systems. Like we don't want that <laughs> being flooded and then causing water quality problems. This mirrors how water at Magnuson Park is managed with a similar device called a pond leveler, which is basically a hidden drain that the beavers can't close off. Beavers Northwest helps the city manage several sites with urban beavers like Longfellow Creek and Meadowbrook Pond. I was just wondering if I heard somebody chewing, but... Back at Magnuson Park... I think I'm just wishful thinking. The twilight hunt for these critters continues. Yeah, so I'm really looking for like a floating head. Beavers really just cruise across the water. This is their active time when you're most likely to spot them. Right as the sun sets, they get to work. Look so silly with that big stick. And sure enough, here they are, with mouths full, changing the landscape one branch at a time. They belong here and, and really, when we restore these areas, uh, I think one of the great stories at Magnuson Park is that, you know, this park used to be a naval air base. And then these wetlands were restored um, in the 2010s, so fairly recently. This is a pretty recent wetland system we have here. They dug all these ponds, they planted tens of thousands of willows, uh, and beavers moved in pretty immediately and said, wow, thank you so much, this is wonderful. And now they're here with the ecological benefits they bring from water quality to climate resilience. Oh, little dive. And the added benefit of knowing these incredible creatures call Seattle home, just like us. It's really special. I think it's just, they're such funny little animals and big animals <laughs> uh, and, it's just neat to see them doing what they do and, and being so successful at it. I didn't have to work very hard to get here. Uh, you know, I, I pretty much drove here and parked my car, walked 20 feet, and here we are, and we've got beavers. Um, and that's, that's amazing. Beavers Northwest also offers free evening nature walks to explore how beavers help both the environment and salmon recovery efforts. To learn more, go to beaversnw.org slash events. We'll be right back. That wraps up this special wildlife edition of City Stream from Lincoln Park. If you'd like to see more outstanding Seattle Channel programs, go to our website, seattlechannel.org, and search feature shows. I'm Enrique Serna. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>